Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We will call this meeting of the Community Economic Development Committee to order. It is 9.01 a.m. We'll start off with introductions from assembly members who are here, present with us, or on the phone telephonically. And then we'll ask other members, uh, other people who are with us today to present themselves as they speak. Um, so, but we do have other folks in the room. I started off with myself, George Martinez. We'll go with my co-chair and we'll move around here. Kevin Cross. Karen Bronga. On the phone. Daniel Zach Johnson. We have Daniel Volan and uh, Zach Johnson. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us today. We have a few presentations that we're going to go through. I'm going to ask the folks to, who are making their presentations to join us at the, the front tables here. Also, when you speak, to, to clearly say your name, where you're from, identify yourself so we can capture it for the public record. We do have some uh, presentations from some outside groups as well that are here, so I welcome all the, the, the folks who are not normally with us. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, let's go into our first presentation. We have the part of our annual work plan items under unfinished business was discussions and continued uh, investigation of the expanding role or expanding the role of land trusts and community land trusts specifically. So to introduce this conversation today with a white paper, we have uh, Mike Robbins, the executive director of the Anchorage Community Development Authority with us, and uh, Mike, take it away. Thank you very much, Chairman Martinez, and thank you all for having me here today. So I know it says authority in our name, but I am not an authority on land trusts. Okay. I just want to say that right off. Uh, but I do want to, uh, we, do, we do have some invited guests that I, I'm not sure if they're online or not, but I have invited some folks that I consider to be authorities on land trust to join us in case there's some additional questions uh, that I can't answer. So I appreciate the opportunity to present to you today, uh, mainly because I educated myself so much during the process of doing the research. We started to talk about land trusts at the last meeting, and I put together a white paper that I hope will um, shed some light on uh, community land trusts, uh, what their uses are, what some of their benefits are, uh, what some of their pitfalls are, and then um, I've also, at the end uh, of the presentation or at the end of the white paper, put uh, a sort of a short synopsis on the land trusts that are at work in Anchorage. Uh, and then I included in the appendix a very, very good uh, discussion or overview from Lincoln EDU. Uh, they just completed in 2022 a census of land trusts across America. And it's a, it, it's a really good overview of the 90 page document they published, which we're going to make available on the ACDA website as soon as they give me permission this morning uh, for download so that you can go and look at that if you're interested in really educating yourself on AD, on uh, on uh, land trust, but really comprehensive and I learned a ton reading through the document. So um, I'm going to breeze through this and not go word for word in the interest of time, uh, but I will spend a little more time on a couple of the sections. So. First of all, um, I've, I've tried to organize my thoughts um, in sort of the important what takeaways uh, from, the, from uh, the white paper, so we'll start there. So the first of all, what's a community land trust? Well, everybody, I thought I knew what a community land trust is, but what, it, what a community land trust really is, um, is a nonprofit that owns land uh, on behalf of the community and that focuses on housing affordability, sustainable development, uh, and mitigating historic inequities uh, in housing. It aims to ensure that a community stewardship of land can serve various purposes from affordable housing to preventing displacement from neighborhood, uh, for neighborhoods and to open space preservation. So when you look at the history, and, and you can see from the screen, again, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but land trust started in, um, the, during the civil rights movement in the South, uh, and they were, um, they originally designed to uh, secure land ownership for the marginal communities um, of, of the time. So if we go to the next page now, uh, when you talk about what, why has the CLT use grown, um, I, th I think it's no secret that across the entire country, 
um, we were having housing issues in almost every metropolitan city. Uh, when you go to that city, they'll talk about the lack of affordable housing. They'll talk about the cost of building. And so the proliferation uh, of land trust is due to the, the, uh, the fact that in a lot of locales, uh, there's been a lot of land speculation. Land gets bought up and held on to so that until the price rises, it can be sold. Uh, also, it, uh, they've, they've continued to proliferate because in, in many locales, they're trying to provide uh, preservation of the natural habitat, preservation of land for future generations. And also, um, in areas where residents want to have more control and say over how development happens. Um, so the ideal scenarios for land, uh, land trusts, first of all, uh, they're best used in areas where es with escalating housing prices. So we certainly know that we're in an area with escalating housing prices. It's happening across the country. Uh, when there's a need to preserve natural lands, uh, and when there again are the residents that want to stay in control of their development. So if you go to the next page, we talk about I talk about some of the advantages of CLTs. They provide permanent housing affordability. They empower the community by giving them a say in land use decisions. They offer long-term housing stability. Um, they, and they also foster public-private partnerships just by their very makeup. Some of the challenges they have is that they can be complex to establish and manage. Um, the homeowners who participate in the land trust uh, may not see significant equity appreciation. And acquiring land, as we know in Anchorage, is a good example. In urban areas, is very diff difficult. So how does a land trust how does the traditional community land trust work? This was the part of the presentation where I really got surprised because I thought that I knew what a land trust was and not work. Um, and when I started to study how they really work, I was very surprised. So in a, in a traditional model, um, the way community land trust works is um, the, the, the government or a private enterprise will, or non, a nonprofit will go in and purchase land. And they will then develop that land and build housing. And they will sell the housing that's on the land, but they won't sell the land. So the person who buys the house gets a 99-year lease on their plot so that they can lease the land. Um, and it's designed in such a way that, that, that they control how the, the price of the house goes up. They control... There's actually a lot of controls. They'll control how much the house can be sold for, so how much equity can be removed. Um, but it's an it's interesting model. So when you look at this diagram that I put together here, it's a ground lease between a nonprofit uh, and the owner of the home, uh, and it has a resale formula built into it. Uh, so it keeps the home affordable for any subsequent buyer. So it's not like the traditional real estate model in the marketplace where Mr. Cross, or Member Cross would go buy a home on the hillside, the value would go up by 30 or 40 percent over 10 years. He would sell it, realize that, and the next person would pay that 30 or 40 percent. Well, community land trusts are designed to maintain the value so there's always affordable housing available in the marketplace. So it sounds like it's similar to a condo association, except for a condo, the owners for a board, you wouldn't have those same rights that you would have under a condo association. It's managed by the community land trust. That way they can keep control of the prices. Correct. In a condo association, okay. you're allowed to sell that condo for whatever price you want. Okay, gotcha. Whatever the market will bear. With the community land, with a with the traditional model of a community land trust, what happens is the community the, the community land trust is forever. So it's designed yeah. to be there forever to maintain that that um, part of the marketplace in terms of affordability. So yes, to answer your question, that they manage the land, they develop the land, that the builders come in, build homes. The homeowners have most of the rights of the, that a traditional homeowner would. They can do what they want on their property. They can, you know, paint their houses. They they own it. They own it, and they have a, a uh, an interest in the land through the 99 year lease, which gives them the ability to finance it. And they can they can will the house to their kids if they want. I mean, they can they can maintain ownership of the land. They just have a formula that's designed to keep it again to keep it from uh, participating in sort of the regular market cycle of increases in value that, because what's happened is over the it, one of the things is that as I studied this that has caused the community of land trust to come into being is that the real estate market has increased so much that as prices increase it pushes people out of the market at the bottom 
And with the land trust, that doesn't happen because the, with the community land trust, you have you always maintain that affordability spectrum, right? So you don't push those people out of the marketplace. So, um, so it, again, very interesting on how the traditional model works. Um, when I when I looked at that, I thought um, very very interesting. I, I never I actually thought a community land trust worked much like we have a very active and very good community land trust here. The Mount, the Anchorage Community Land Trust that operates out of Mountain View, they do a fabulous job. I thought that's what a community land trust was supposed to do, but it's sort of a hybrid, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, they do a great job. So, if we go to the next slide, oh. here's the community. I'm sorry. Before you move on, the property tax part. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, no, I'm wrong. <laughs> so do they pay, they pay property on the taxes. land and yes. the structure? Yes, because the 99-year lease gives them a uh, gives them an interest in the land, just like uh, just like ownership, okay. especially under our tax okay. code in, in <laughs> uh, Just for the record, I want to identify that member uh, Constant and member Brawley have joined us in the room uh, approximately 9:05. Uh, uh, this morning, and we're also joined by Council Dean Gates. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Continue. So, in a uh, housing crisis in CLTs, due to the Anchorage new housing stock and aging inventory and climbing real estate values, CLTs are being recognized as a valuable tool for addressing the affordable housing crisis across the country. There, that's one of the reasons that they have proliferated, but. Uh, and and uh, in cities like Anchorage, where prices are going up, land is shrinking, the availability, the cost of building is going up, they are, they're becoming an alternative to make sure that we maintain housing affordability at the entry level of the marketplace. So um, when we talk about the active, uh, I wanted to include a list of the uh, of active CLTs in the Anchorage area. Now there are some state organizations that call themselves CLTs, but after examination of them, uh, for example, there's the, I think it's called the Alaska Housing Trust. It's not really a land trust, but their, their focus is more on affordable financing. It's not necessarily what, what the CLT does. So when you look at the CLTs that are working in Anchorage, we have, um, I've included, there's, I believe there's five on the list. I've included HLB and ACDA because even though we're not land trusts, we, there, are thing, there are parts of the way we do things that land trusts also do, and I think it's important for you to look at that and know that. It was important for me to learn that. So we look at the land trust. We have the Anchorage Affordable Housing and Land Trust, established in 2022 by, this, by the Assembly, um, and its mission is strengthening the community by acquiring, creating, and operating, preserving permanent affordable housing for low and extremely low income residents. Um, the partnership is uh, philanthropic, government, and the private sector. Uh, the focus is on low and extremely low income housing, below the 80% of the AMI. Uh, purchases, they purchase hotels and convert them to permanent housing. Current projects uh, or properties include the Guest House, Lakeshore, and of course they're about to bring the Barry in online. So, so that model uh, is being used across the country. Uh, they're calling it a land trust, but it is somewhat of a hybrid. Uh, because in a lot of markets, when you study land trusts, they will do the affordable. They will do this, and they'll have a, a land trust where they sell housing too. But this is one of the models that's that's come about in the country as a result of the homeless growth population and lack of affordable housing. Anchorage Community Land Trust, as I said, I spoke about them earlier. It was established in 2003, and. Uh, They've done a phenomenal job over the last 20 years. They've invested in Anchorage neighborhoods, um, and they, they have a variety of tools in their tool belt, uh, but their focus has been a little more, their focus has been more on economic development. And they're, even though they're called a land trust, they're sort of self-admittedly more of a CDC kind of an organization, uh, of economic development, more than buying land and make it affordable for people to build and own housing. Does that make sense? And you can, you can look, I also included links to all of these websites so that you can take a look at them. Um, but their focus is on promoting uh, equitable economic development in the neighborhoods they serve. Uh, and they are outside of Mountain View. They're in Spinard, they're in Muldoon, they're in East Anchorage. They're working throughout the community. Um, and they, but they've been primarily focused previously on the commercial space along the Mountain View corridor 
They've invested $15 million in nine properties on Mountain View Drive, but it's caused almost a three to one return on investment, which is phenomenal. Again, they do a great job. And I don't know if Kirk's on the line or not. He said he was not feeling well this morning. He was gonna come in person, but he said he'd call in and listen. So if anybody has any questions, he's available to answer. So as far as the Great Land Trust goes, and I'm glad to see Ellen is in the room. <laughs> Ellen, the Great Land Trust is one of the oldest land trusts in the state. Um, and it was established in 1995. And, and it meets one of the primary mission of land trusts across the country. Uh, and that is the pre preservation of habitat and lands for future generations. Um, they have completed a, an incredible amount of projects in Anchorage, they have over 21 projects. Statewide, they've done almost 70 projects over the years that they've completed. Um, and it's a partnership that's built between the philanthropic community, the government, and the private sector uh, with a focus on preservation. And um, one of the things after, again, I learned a lot about the Great Land Land Trust. I didn't really wasn't familiar with them. Um, they focus on working with willing landowners and stakeholders. They, they wanted to make sure that, that uh, they're, they're not an organization that looks to take land from people. They, they work with the landowners versus going in and saying, yeah, we need to conserve that and we're gonna take it away from you because we need to protect ducks or we need to have more waterfowl or whatever it is. And so I think that's something somewhat unique too about the organization. It's not just conservation focused. The Anchorage Community Development Authority, I uh, don't need to talk a lot about them. We were established by code in 2004 um, our mission is to serve as a catalyst for development. And the part of what we've been doing that, that sort of matches with the community land trust model um, is the, for example, the 8th and K project where we bought the land and provided it on a very favorable lease so that the builder could go in and build the building and make it pencil. And then we also contributed cash resources to that project. And we have two or three other projects that we're working on with that are similar models where we'll buy the land and maintain a very low lease to make those projects affordable so the builders can come and develop housing. Um, the Heritage Land Bank um, goes without saying that they are really Anchorage's, they don't, they're not called a CLT, or, but, but they, their mission uh, is to manage uncommunicable, uncommunicable <coughs> municipal land, as you know, um, and keep it in the land bank to preserve it for the use for future generations for economic and community development purposes. So while, um, while they're not a land, a CLT, they perform one of the functions that a CLT does, which is to hold and preserve available land for development, which I thought warranted mentioning them here. And then we have the Girdwood Land Trust, which was established, it's the youngest of all of them, uh, it was established in 2021, and their mission is to manage land for community and economic development needs. They've been involved to this point in, uh, in recycling in Girdwood. They've, they've done some other community things, uh, and they're very heavily uh, invested right now in planning and in trying to develop a plan for Girdwood uh, and for development in Girdwood so that they can responsibly develop the land based on what the community wants. One of the things about community land trusts is that they're, uh, they, in fact, if you read or read some of the extended links that I provided you with, community land trusts generally have a board made up. So for example, let's say we wanted to develop Fairview or a section of Fairview. We developed, we could put a community land trust in place. It would be made up, for example, of the owners in that area. They would serve on the board of the land trust. So they would have a say and how things are done and how things are developed, if that makes sense. Even though they may not own any of the land when the development finishes, we, they still take into account and give the residents of the neighborhood and the areas an ability to have a say in what's happening in those areas. Mike, yes, just sir. a note, you said the Girdwood one was the newest one, but it I'm sorry, that was a mistake. appears that the Anchorage Thank Affordable you. Housing Trust was. Yes, I apologize. Thanks for pointing that out. I realized that as soon as the words came out, it was just too late to go back. <laughs> Um, so, um, most of the CLTs in Anchorage are partnerships, which, I, which is really um, good for us. Uh, it's partnerships between government bodies, it's partnership between philanthropic and, and for the community. Very impressive when you look at the, the uh, Great Land Land Trust. I saw like 
over a hundred individuals listed as contributors. Not corp they have corporations and they have philanthropic organizations, but individuals too. And that's that's what makes community land trust work. Is it represents the interests of the community, not any not just the special interest of one section. Um, so community land trust can also be very very good uh, for wealth building. Uh, especially in the in the entry level into the housing market, because most people, the two large, one of the, the largest purchase they'll ever make in their life is their house, for most individuals. And if you take away the right, or you don't, if you take away the ability of someone to purchase a home, it dramatically affects their ability to build wealth. And as we know, not that the whole point of our lives is to build wealth, but but the accumulation of some modest amount of wealth gives you security for your family and the ability to pass things on. And, and so that's one of the reasons community land trusts have come into being is because it gives that entry level and marginalized communities the ability to begin to build wealth, which is something that what didn't exist before for them. So again, more information. There's a YouTube link here that's a, got a really good short cartoon on how community land trusts work if you want to access that. And then if, you, if you'll scroll down a little bit more after these links, as I mentioned, um, in the appendix you'll find, you can go down a little further, this is a census that was done in 2022, which is a very good abstract discussion about CLTs. It talks about their use, the proliferation, and the 90-page document for anybody who really wants to understand how CLTs work uh, is accessible on their website and will be on ACDA's website. Uh, and it's very thorough in its explanation and in the, the ways that you can use it, the way that it's governed, the way that you've set it up. Um, so I, I encourage you, if you're interested in educating you and finding out more, that you go there and check it out. Um, thanks for giving me an opportunity to present. In closing, I just want to say that uh, CLTs are a flexible and viable tool for us to help, uh, for us to address our, our affordable housing problems and our housing shortage. Um, the, the housing challenges we have now in Anchorage are too big for just the builders to solve. It's not just about making the builders build. Uh, unfortunately, we're at, a, we're at a crisis situation where government is gonna have to help. And that means you guys, you guys are gonna have to come up with a plan to help provide some sort of assistance to the private sector and the, the nonprofits when they all come together uh, as you have been with the, the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, but but it's, it's gonna take a little bit of government assistance to kickstart the process and get it going. And <coughs> CLTs are, are used in a lot of markets, but one of the things that almost every article talks about is that they're, they're, not, they're not isolated, they're not an oasis. They're used in conjunction with other incentives and other programs, whether it be infrastructure, or whether it be tax incentives, or TIF financing, or lots of other things, so. Great. Um, Yes, we'll go through a queue. I'd just like to say thank you, Mike, for the presentation. One of the main roles of the assembly, especially with our committees, is to convene information, to be able to share information. And this is all learning for yourself. I think it's learning for us as well. But fundamentally, people who are occupying the same or parts of the same ecosystem are meeting each other physically today. So I just wanted to highlight that as well. Um, this really dovetails with, with some of what we're going to continue to talk about later on. I saw Member Brawley with a question, so we could open it up with a few with Member Brawley. Yeah, um, I guess it's a, a comment and a question, but um, but I, I'm really interested in this area, um, similar to the fact that I'm interested in resident-owned communities for mobile homes, and even HOAs, you know, there's pros and cons to those, but really what they allow you, they spread the risk um, and the kind of liability among multiple owners, too. Um, so I, I think they're a really great way to increase home ownership, and um, and I guess I want to uh, flip the idea in its head that, that the downside of it is that you don't um, necessarily build um, as much equity as you would in a traditional kind of fee simple home ownership. But on the on the other hand, um, if if that's the only way that our housing market operates, then only people with a lot of money can afford to buy into our town, right? And so and so if you want if you accept the idea that that we should have a lot of different people and have Especially folks who you know maybe have been here for generations, um, but don't have that um, don't have that money in the bank. Um, that, that otherwise, otherwise, basically, we have to. It's, it's a community that you just have to buy into, which I think is not um, 
you know, not, not necessarily the community we want to be. So I appreciate that. Um, I wonder, um, I, I just if anybody is aware, other than the community land trusts that have been mentioned, are there um, builders or, or potential owners or anybody who's talking about kind of creating one of these? Uh, you know, I know there was Ravens, there was co-housing, which I know is not this situation, but are there any, does anyone know of any other um, entities that are pursuing this kind of model? I'm just curious. Yeah. I, I, I didn't find any, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I, I didn't find any. Maybe somebody else, or maybe it's one of the folks from one of the land trusts. It's, if somebody's on the line, they might know, but um, I, I didn't find any. So. I hadn't heard of it. Yeah. Member Brown? So, what is the, so I'm thinking about the middle school property by Totem Theater and wondering what would be the process to get in in the land trust and I mean, in in the very even long future, there's going to be no middle school needed for that area, um, and thinking that could be an amazing place for a housing development. It could be actually. So the process to try to move it from the city actually owns school district property. <coughs> or I believe it's. I think that. Tiffany. Um, so. It is in the name of the municipality, but the school district does have management authority over it. So um, we would work with them. They um, would need to do an internal analysis as far as is that <coughs> parcel access to their need, um, and then we could um, go from there. But we would need to work with the school district on because I do believe there was um, money involved in like, purchasing it. Okay. So. We have a question from uh, Kevin. Well, not much of a question, more of a thought on this, because um, as um, Anna brought up, that we see this kind of like the real estate-owned communities that uh, the uh, rural community block grant program is extending over into trailer parks. So this is interesting because, you know, typically when we associate a community land trust, we're thinking new construction. One of the difficulties that we've seen is we have older apartment buildings and things like that, a lot of them around Anchorage that have, uh, you know, close to the end of their life expectancy or need considerable repairs. But the challenge with turning things into condos where we have individual owners where they can get equity to the property or at least in their owner is that the property has to be free and clear of debt. Otherwise, you can't condoize it because you're basically fractionalizing the ownership. And you got to re, and you got to, you know, establish new tax IDs. So there can't be any debt on the property. But there's an opportunity there on older distressed properties, I think, where a community land trust can come in and purchase it. They own the land. And because there would be no debt on it, they can condoize those, improve the property, and then give individual ownerships of the properties. And therefore, you create excellent idea. You create affordable housing, you keep rents at bay, and you're revitalizing older properties, which will take us into our next thing here: vacant and abandoned properties. So I might have a mental exercise on Perfect. what it would look like—not just new construction, but using that to revitalize older distressed properties within our community. The land trust could take that whole list of distressed properties and figure out how to acquire them. And redo them and use them as affordable sort of entry. You could use the same model. Well, this is exactly a great dovetail and segue. Um, one of the land trusts that is here that I would love to ask that question to, um, I saw Jason uh, Vakastad from the, let me say it right, because it's a long one, from the newest case, uh, the Anchorage Affordable Housing Land Trust. We're going to have a conversation of distressed properties next, and um, are, are you all looking at other types of stocks other than the big projects that you have focused on thus far? Yeah, you want me to go up there? Yes, please, you? and just identify yourself. Thank you. Oh, you could. Okay. Yeah. You said your name 40 times. 40 times, okay. <laughs> yeah, Jason Bakkenset, uh, the executive director for the Anchorage Affordable Housing and Land Trust. Uh, you know, to your, to your question, yeah, I think we're absolutely looking at what other opportunities are there to acquire you know this the smaller properties not necessarily just the just the hotels and i think certainly looking at the very long probably incomplete uh list of vacant and abandoned properties in our um community is is certainly uh, one of those areas in which we would definitely be interested you know we've certainly 
um, you know, explored and had conversations with you know every level of government in terms of trying to identify funding opportunities to, to try to acquire those. Certainly, you know, just in the last week, I know you guys, you know, approved the HUD action plan, but there is, you know, I think there was about eight hundred thousand dollars that was included in the CDBG funds that would be uh, allowed for acquisition of property. Um, those would be the types of things that we would be. Um, trying to explore, and then certainly, you know, as as Mike mentioned earlier, you know, m my goal would be to take any funding that we received from, you know, local, state, and local government, and go to our philanthropic partners and say, would you be willing to match this um, to to try to go uh, further? So certainly, that's something that we're we're definitely interested in, and if if we were able to acquire these properties, I think to to Anna and, and Kevin's points, we would very much uh, like to see how we can get into that home ownership uh, model um, and, and certainly provide um, you know properties that are well below what the market value would be but also um, you know for you know folks that are kind of getting in that first time home ownership if we own the property the interest rate that we would be able to charge uh, would be negligible compared to what they would have to go to out on the marketplace um, to finance it through a bank or something like that. That's exciting news. I want to pivot us into the next part of our conversation and presentation because what, what I want us all to understand is that, um, and this, this, these two subjects really overlap from, for us today, we're talking about tools and land trusts to be able to utilize, to to effectively create some strong impact in the community. One of the areas that we're identifying are distressed properties. And uh, we've already introduced that conversation. Today we, I, so I wanna, I wanna move us into a little presentation from Scott. Um, and Scott will identify himself. And then we'll still keep talking about this. So I want us to also have hopefully some time for some brainstorming that we'll capture today. Some of what you just mentioned, Jason, for example, some concepts around what you just mentioned, Mr. Cross, some things we can capture as potential actions, potential ideas to keep, keep noodling through. But uh, for, for my purpose, this is one of those clear areas of immediate opportunity without necessarily thinking of new buildings and new development, but thinking of existing stock, housing stock, that also has uh, an, an impact to the community uh, because of their conditions. And so uh, we have with us, uh, let Scott introduce himself, but we'll have a presentation on a little bit, a little bit more in depth of what vacant and abandoned properties in Anchorage look like and what are some of the options that we may be able to, uh, to consider. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Scott Campbell, Chief of Inspections with the Municipality. I oversee all the building inspectors for the city and I also oversee the code abatement team which is comprised of four individuals that, that deal with our vacant and abandoned buildings. For those of you who are not familiar with the DNAs, uh, under Title 15 of MOA code, you have a duty to register your property if it is going to be vacant. You should do this within 30 days. Um, we keep a running list of these vacant and abandoned buildings. Um, and as you can see here, here is the list of abandoned buildings per district. Um, right now, I believe we have a little over 150 that are currently active. One thing that I want to point out is that this is just a few that we actually know about, the people that have been honest enough to register their building. Um, we do believe there's significantly more. This is just a fraction of what's out there. Um, unfortunately, like I said, we only have four code abatement officers for the entire municipality, which is, you know, quite extensive. So we do not have the manpower to actually canvas every one of these. Um, and we don't have the, the, the actual um, people to go out and look for, for new ones. So th these are the ones we actually know about. Can you filter by property first tab? And scroll to the top. So this is a list of all the properties that we have. Um, what we tried to do with this spreadsheet is um, the purpose of creating this list was to, we, we keep a running tab so we, we know which properties are registered, but we 
kind of exploded and tried to data mine and put data into this list. Um, the purpose was is to try to quantify the MOA labor involved with these VNAs. Um, we try to take an analytical approach to this in an attempt to see where our time and the taxpayer money was spent. Um, and also, just to kind of see where we have some, some problems. We, we, we work really closely with APD and AFD, and what we found is a lot of the properties that are on this list tend to be also those properties that consume a tremendous amount of MOA resources um, because they are broken into frequently, they are, fires are started frequently, we have, as you know, every single one of you have, has one of these in your district, and I, and I think I have email correspondence with many of you regarding some of these. So they not only consume our time for development services, they consume APD's time and AFD's time. So if you want to go filter for MOA parcel, there you go. So we tried to add a priority level of these, these based upon um, whether this property is bank owned. Um, we have, we run into complications when properties are bank owned because they get put into preservation companies. These preservation companies are very difficult to work with because they're out of state. They don't monitor these properties. They don't take care of them. Um, they don't board them up. They don't follow Title 15 and their duties, which are duty to register, duty to sign, um, duty to, uh, sorry, but we've got jumbled up on my words here. But basically what we're trying to do is figure out where our problem childs lie, so to speak. So we put a number or a, a priority level to each one of these. Um, we, gave a, we gave a point if it was a bank owned property. One if it's multi-family, uh, one if it's been multi-years as a VNA. Um, whether we have fines and fees, we gave a point for a priority. And uh, whether one of these properties has been a nuisance as far as we have to constantly go there every day or every other day. And as you can see, a lot of these properties are bank owned. Um, and this is the list based upon our labor that we have involved with it. And as you can see, the estimated MOA labor in column L, those are our service requests. So when somebody calls in a complaint, we fill out a service request, we investigate that complaint. So for 825 North Bliss, we have 107. We, does that include police and fire? That does not does include not police include and fire. fire. That includes responders. That's just development services. So we threw a very, very, very conservative number, 2.5 hours per. <coughs> and if you scroll to the bottom of this list, you can see that things kind of add up. And do you want to identify the call site? This is Mr. Constant. The number of calls that add up to those hours, is that in this list? The number of phone calls? No. No, no. It, like you get a call, like you have to go out. Yep. That is a service request. So there is the amount of service requests. I did 2.5 hours per service request. So, so each one of those on the bottom is just have one call. If you scroll to the top again. Okay. If you've got the bottom of the Yeah. It'd be great to have a column that just shows the number of calls because mm -hmm. this argues for considering Dean <clears throat> when you get Dean's attention. This conversation calls for considering adding code enforcement calls to the 880 section of the code. Oh, excessive calls? Mm -hmm. Mr. Gosling, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> I would need to look into that. I think there's some, I mean, some would conclude to any types of calls and response. Right. Well, maybe we come up with a parallel section of code where after a certain number of calls, we start to record fines and fees on the title of the property until they deal with it. We do have many recorded fines and fees for some of these properties, column M, as you can see. So, how in the heck do we get, sorry, $270,000 without collection or without action? We have placed recordations and liens on the property. This is something actually we've talked to Kevin about a little bit regarding some of our fines and fees and how to collect. Um, one of the issues we're currently having is with our preservation companies. And what they do is typically they 
these parcels get stuck in probate or they're in the process of foreclosure um, they get a the, the bank hires a preservation company to, to, to manage the property um, during that time most of these preservation companies are out of state they hire somebody else from another state who eventually hires somebody up here to do the work on some of these properties and it takes forever to get them to respond accordingly and during that time where they're not responsive is the time where the houses get broken into the fire start um, the safety and security of the neighbors gets compromised due to the fact that these preservation companies really aren't doing their job we had a, a question for yeah it was on the, the labor hours this is Anna um, so how many staff I mean I understand your the logic with the call time how many staff total would be represented in that column so it, it it's it's over years so it fluctuates but I can tell you right now with our four code abatement officers we did a little math yesterday and roughly 40 percent of our time is spent dealing with just registration following these VNAs. Okay. Because because what I'm seeing there, I mean, 2,200 hours. That's about one FTE for a year. Yep. So we've basically used a year of a muni staff person's time just to deal with this. I yep. mean, and, and the fact that you're saying so many of them are out of state, I understand we can't. Um, obviously, people have the right to own property in this town, regardless of where they live, you know, in, in state or not. But it does strike me that. Basically, you know, the cost of, of negligent land ownership or property ownership in this town costs the rest of us who live here. And it is yet again an argument to increase the number of residents who live in these properties uh, or own these properties who are in state and willing to do the work. And even more so when they go to institutional ownership like a bank. So this is frustrating. <laughs> Thank you for putting it out. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> I feel your frustration. Yeah. So does our poor code abatement officers. Sure. Yeah, we have a member Brown. So I was, I recognize there's tons that are not on this list. Mm -hmm. So when, so I know there's a property in my neighborhood that has not had heat, water for at least five years, you know, sandbags on the roof with a tarp. Mm -hmm. And we were told the gentleman's making progress. <laughs> so at what point is, is it real progress or, you know, we say this is not mm -hmm. acceptable well yeah that's that's something that uh if you were to if we investigated and you found that you know every every case is different right, right. so in, in that particular instance we'd have to do our research before i would comment on it okay a really accurate response um but i would assume that you know if it if, if it's been vacant no hot water no no electricity um <coughs> It should be registered as a vacant and abandoned building, okay. and that's the duty of that property. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how much it might cost on a contract to do a canvas of the whole town? You know, we've talked about that, um, but it's it's difficult to quantify that number because we 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 just don't have the staff to do it. I, I would think it's a contract, not as a as a staffing issue. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's someone we could pay to drive every street in this town. Yeah. I just wonder what kind of time that might take and how much it would cost. You know, we probably know these streets better than anybody, our inspectors and our code abatement staff. And I would say that if you were to want to get a more accurate representation of what's out there, these would be the best people to get to do the job it's just if they do that they're not going to be doing their daily things so one of the things we've recognized is just that need for for extra help in our department you're already at 40 percent yeah and uh if i may thank you sure. the it's interesting where you you draw that line because you know the circumstances are different around there are negligent owners but there are like you mentioned there are situations where Maybe an older couple was in the property, they passed away, their estate wasn't handled property, it goes into probate, that can take over a year. The people, the family who inherited the property, they don't have the resources, they're, you know, now they're stuck with the obligations that this property then presents. They can't legally sell it until it goes through probate. And so, you know, do you just come in and seize somebody's property while they're going through this? And I think is the, the role of government, we'd be very, very cautious to do that. 
but at the mm -hmm. same time, obviously there's some expense and it's creating a safety hazard, so you yeah. lean it, but then how long <coughs> does it take? And, un and regretfully, that, that, that responsibility on us to stay on top of it, or our responsibility on you to stay on top of it, obviously, is a, a large aggregate and expense. Mm -hmm. And I think as our, and this is really important to note, as our housing inventory inventory continues to get older, we're just going to see more of these because mm -hmm. at some point houses yep. get so aged out that they're not, yep. you know, it's better to start over. Yep. And can you please put it on the first tab and scroll to the bottom? And easy. Ooh, there you go. I kind of totaled up the living units that are out there vacant right now. So we're at 238 living units. I put uh, roughly two people, you know, as a minimum per living unit, um, four for some, and uh, the apartments I ended up uh, giving the three, three people to just to you know their small residences. So as you can see, we actually have quite an enormous amount of opportunity here. Um, one of the things to highlight on on your comment, these probate issues in, in these properties, um, we see them in every district, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has one or two houses in their neck of the woods that are in a similar situation where, you know, the property owner's passed, the property's been willed or it's in probate, and the next thing you know, that one house in your neighborhood is, is getting a lot of complaints. Let me follow up. Yes, the other thing is I notice on this, without naming names, I see s there's some uh, property owners on there that own one or more distressed mm -hmm. properties. Yes. Um, or, or you know, just, now we're just leaning the distressed property. Um, is there any provision that if an individual owns a considerable amount of real estate assets that you're able to take, uh, if you're in, after a certain period of time and you're not getting, they're not addressing that one, we're able to take those fines and levy it against other real estate that they own that is not distressed? Yeah. I would love to be able to get there. We're in a constant state of triage, and we have not been able to follow through with a lot of these the way we'd like to. Because I mean, if I, I mean, if I were, a, if I were a, a heartless individual, I mean, what would be is you go ahead and lean that property. What am I yeah. get? What are you going to do? Take it? It's already distressed. It's costing me a bunch. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But if you're able and you have the authority, understanding that I'm the owner and I have other assets in my name, you can say, hey, wait a second. You know, you, we may not be able to get anything out of this one, but you have other assets. That might be an incentive to act. Mm -hmm. Just a thought on that. I'm going to jump you. in there, Mr. Chair, and just say that one property owner has nearly 25% of the total fines and fees yeah. levied. Yeah. Right, and so that's just their cost of doing business for them, and they don't care. Yeah. And so the question is, let's pick one and start working on that one very aggressively. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, I, we had an email complaint about a property where people were forced out because it was unlivable. I would bet that it is this property owner who that we had to kind of deal with all of the offshoots of that problem. And so, um, correct me if I'm wrong. So um, anyhow, there is some argument to be said for coming up with an alternative means if it doesn't exist now. Yeah, what, right, but just considering the tools that we, that we, we need mm -hmm. toward what approaches, mm -hmm. uh, we also need to consider state action. Mm -hmm. And um, what state actions may be required to give us more tools to be able to move properties into a space where I think we're talking about getting stock, housing stock online, mm -hmm. and fundamentally getting housing stock back online. Um, Member Brawl? Yeah, um, I had a question, but also, I mean, I'm really interested in that kind of how do we, because the first step is getting control of the property, it sounds like, or at least, you know, compelling the owner to, to do something with it. And so that's step one, but then I'm thinking about step two, um, you know, which is, you know, regardless of who develops it or redevelops it, I guess, do you have a sense of what proportion of these properties are basically in a condition that's so bad that they need to get torn down? Because one thing that's on my mind, I'm aware that especially for, I think, multifamily, but probably smaller buildings too, the cost of renovating a building can be as much as building new here right now. Mm -hmm. And especially if there's things like bringing it up to code, like serious issues that have been in the property since it was built. Um, you know, exactly, yeah. So I just wonder, um, you know, I, I love the idea of, of fixing up these properties, but realistically, how many of, like, you know, is it less than half that are in a condition that are like financially feasible to fix? Or are we talking mostly teardowns at this point? I think that's just, it's, too broad of a generalization yeah. to make. I think you would need to take each property individually. Um, I, 
I know our code abatement team, that's that's what they do. You know, that's the other half of what they do is they do code compliance inspections and they go into fire rehabs. They are the entity that goes in and tells you what you need to tear out, what you need to put back in. So right. we have we have the tools, we just don't have enough of them. Yeah, and I think that's something to think about too, is, is if, if we're looking at resources, some of it might be going toward demolition, right? Just, be, just yeah, because- Absolutely. Because otherwise, if you're buying a property that you have to tear it down, it's, it's actually a negative value to you, right? Like the, the Northern Lights Hotel cost a million dollars just to tear down, just to get it back to zero. Yes. So that's something just to put into the mix, is thinking about how to pay for getting rid of some of these physically deteriorated properties. Mm -hmm. And we actually have ARPA money that's been allocated to our department, and we are in the process right now. We have, I think, four, five, six, four or five, six prospects of, of buildings that we're in the process of negotiating a stipulated agreement to where we can demo the property so the property owner can then go sell the property. They don't have the means right now to get out from underneath it, um, and it's costing us money to keep it there, so we're willing to demo and open up that property for development. All right, um, stick around here because I want us to move past this. This is available for folks to look at. There are more questions, uh, but I, I would love for us to throw my presentation on, uh, which is just a few points of discussion that I wanted to capture, some of what we're talking about now. Uh, and so I let this kind of be a little bit of a guide for this continued discussion for the next 10 minutes and hopefully also to capture ideas and concepts about potential strategies. Uh, my first reaction to uh, that redevelopment of a, of a, or a, a bulldoze of a property so that we can clear it to give an, op an option to, or an opportunity to redevelop it speaks in my mind to uh, a, a, a gap that I want to make sure we do close, which is how we capture and secure housing stock through all of our development and redevelopment opportunities for the duration to be able to count on a certain amount of housing stock that fits our categories of need today. Um, and that's why I really appreciate the land trust conversation. And I, I hope that folks are also thinking about ideas and solutions and ways that linkages could work. So we'll go past the first slide. Um, vacant properties aren't good for anchors. Now, we're, we heard about this today, but we've heard, um, and, and Mike, I really appreciate that you mentioned about wealth building with respect to having people have access into um, property. But vacant properties themselves impact uh, value of the other surrounding properties, so there's a negative impact to equity um, and the property equity by having vacant properties languish and continue to be nuisance and deteriorate. There's a harm to public health. And you see here identifying both in terms of the physical health of some of the properties that are out there and some of the unscrupulous activities that are happening in some of those properties that actually affect real lives and real people's lives and their health, but also the emotional well-being of what it feels like to have these properties in your neighborhood, what it, what's the signal that's being sent to the kids that are on their way to school. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's all of these health impacts as well, let alone the increasing crime rates that go up. And to the point of the Scott's data, the amount of man hours or people hours that were identified in Scott's report did not take into account police and fire calls on any of these particular properties, which we absolutely know is there because we've made some of those calls and have received some of them ourselves. But we've also now heard that there are harm to public finances, municipal revenue, um, they cost to maintain, and let alone the public safety cost. The biggest challenge for us, for me, is that, and I hope that we focus on is, this represents a significant amount, just this list alone, a significant amount of housing stock that's offline. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fundamental gist why this is not just an interesting conversation, why it's not just, uh, you know, um, dollars and cents particularly, although there's a significant impact to the municipality. This is about an urgent need 
in our community as well. Kevin? You know, it's interesting because we like to banter that uh, the terms around, uh, you know, infill and density and those things, but this is the perfect solution is if you're able to get those units because all you're doing is improving the neighborhoods. You're technically not adding any more units to it. You're just, but it's the ultimate infill mm -hmm. for our housing needs without changing or altering the demographics of our neighborhood, staying, staying consistent with our land use plan and all the concerns that the, the community yeah. has. Yeah. Fixing these and targeting those as our great uh, as a housing effort is the least resistance of anything that you could do. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree that I think this is a significant starting point. And let's go to the next one. So we have a good picture. We, when we talk about rethinking, and all of this information has been pulled from resources that were shared previously, uh, readings and two meetings ago. So you'll have access to this information as well. But um, vacant and abandoned, how do we understand what we need to do with respect to code enforcement, tax collection, and the foreclosure processes to be able to give the city tools? Um, what are the tools that we have available to us? How do they work? What are the limitations of those tools? These are the questions that I think are really important for us to continue to think about and capture. So as folks who are thinking about these tools, help us digest the deeper into this, the, the landscape here, but we have these possible tools, which is why I'm really excited about this dovetail today of these two presentations, because here we, we, we've identified that land banks acquire properties in various ways, we, we talked about that, with core powers that basically create tremendous opportunity in, in, with unique strength and unique powers that uh, Without utilizing, we would be at a disadvantage. And by utilizing, we could see successes. I mean, we've had national attention over the last two weeks from the work that the Assembly has done with the Affordable Housing Land Trust and its partners with respect to some of the, the buildings of coming back online and housing stock. But now we're going to Mr. Point, Mr. Kevin's, uh, Kevin's, uh, Kevin Cross's point. This is in our neighborhoods today. And the first list was how many properties across everyone's assembly district. So this is absolutely low-hanging fruit, even though it is complex. And let me just highlight that we have strategic demolition as a possible tool. But again, it's what do we do with the properties after the fact, and how do we capture the investment over time for ourselves as potential units of, of development, whether they're housing or they're green or blue space units of uh, development. Temporarily interventions, this is primarily for the commercial properties, and we see this a lot as potential tools. Um, we did an artist co-op pop-up in the Key Bank building a few years ago, downtown, that was with the downtown partnership, a collaborative effort that essentially created an activation of public spa of space in a private building that created public art initiative that is still impacting downtown. So there are some interesting things that people could do to explore, but fundamentally, how can we create favorable climate to redevelop for our developers and financing and the regulatory things we need to move to get them out of the way? Kevin? Yeah, and Anna's probably already rich this up because she's the most voracious researcher I've ever known. Yeah. But in the 1970s, HUD came up with a program called Urban, Urban Homesteading, and it was, it was bantered about by HUD again in 2019, and they may actually be moving forward with the program. But it uses federal dollars where basically a public entity such as land bank authorities leverage new sources or federal dollars to acquire vacant homes and distressed properties and then partner with low-income homeowners to rehabilitate the properties. You, the municipality has to submit a plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Authority to outline their strategy, identify the properties, come up with it. But there's a program out there called Urban Homesteading that we should probably look into. Yes, yes, and, and just identify when we had the presentation from our HUD grant manager now, uh, Jed. I don't know. I forget, I forget how to say his last name. Uh, just the other day. Yeah. We talked a little bit about uh, how the HUD dollars that were identified earlier, CDG, 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 whatever money, uh, can be utilized. And yeah, if we have, we have the ability to leverage resources 
with our local resources, with HUD dollars, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to explore uh, these units. The last thing here, though, I want to identify is term usage agreements. And this is what some cities have done to lock in the housing stock, so that if the municipality is a part of the investment strategy to create a classification of the housing, it's affordable housing, for example, and we're utilizing the land trust or land bank concept, you essentially are saying that the, the, if not in perpetuity, for a duration, the, housing, the housing will stay at this particular classification of a stock. And this gives a tool to potentially work with ind private individuals who may have, house, have a property that can come alongside this as well, who are willing to go into a housing stock program, basically, to say they are willing to have their housing be in our role of, of uh, affordable housing or voucher programs, and that really goes to the ecosystem of the landlord liaison programs that we support through the municipality resources for neighbor works. And so there's a, there's a whole ecosystem of folks that can help come alongside. But I think it's important that we're not only talking about redeveloping and activating these housing uh, opportunities, but we're locking some degree of the stock in and the category of, uh, in so we know we are not just activating housing to go to free market but we're activating housing to stay in some degree of the classification for a duration of time. And I think that's important. Next uh, piece, please, and we're gonna move here. Addressing our housing needs. Again, I want folks to take a look at this and give us feedback. We'll have more conversations about this, but fundamentally, strategic investments in vacant and abandoned properties to support various classifications of housing stock, <coughs> i.e., Permanent supportive housing, voucher program, SROs, workforce, and low income housing. We've heard from the Affordable Land Trust development today, but we would hopefully we have a presentation. I don't see them here yet, but for Outreaching Lives, uh, Sean Sullivan, who is working on permanent supportive housing uh, opportunity with some distressed properties that were previously on our list in Mountain View. So there are individuals who are taking uh, initiative on it, and I want us to be able to think of identifying the local nonprofit partners to spearhead the redevelopment. We've had the hand wave today from uh, Jason Bockenstedt. Identify the for-profit partners to spearhead redevelopment and provide necessary services. So this is just, how do we open this up to everyone who can potentially come on in here? How do we identify the near list property? This is to me is beyond who's on our list, there are ways we can identify potentially distressed properties by looking at different data sources to identify potential foreclosures, for example, of things that give us a sense of where some challenges may be so we can be in a prevention this, uh, posture as well. And to, to the point that was just mentioned, how we leverage local HUD resources, I hope that folks are really thinking deeply and thinking about uh, these as well. And the last slide is no more slide. So. <laughs> The point of this transition. Yeah, the point of this presentation was not necessarily a workshop, but it was to get us all starting to look at a picture of something we can accomplish, uh, a target that we can actually have multiple units of government come alongside our public private partnerships and do something about. And and to the point of we have an urgent challenge in our community today. And there are a lot of things floating around about what we could do to effectively increase growth and housing and the cost. This seems like a starting point that has a substantial amount of opportunity for us to mine, learn, and grow from. So uh, thank you, Scott, for the presentation. Thank you, Mike, for your presentation. I think these things really work well together. I see the ACDA can have a tremendous role in and playing alongside this particular uh, area of interest. Hey George, we got a, we'll have an enterprise meeting at 11, so we want to make sure we're out of here at hard 10:30. Yeah. I have a concern. This is constant. ACDA generates revenue from parking downtown, and so any conversation about taking revenue from what's generated downtown into all parts of the municipality has to be considered very carefully because the tax that's being levied on the downtown merchants and property owners, this parking fee, 
is in that drain if we start to invest it all over town. And so it needs to be targeted, it needs to be very directed, it needs to be limited, because I'll be damned if we're going to destroy downtown businesses with heavy-handed parking to begin the process of making other neighborhoods all across town look and feel great. The polish that we would apply is literally drained out of the downtown. And so um, I do have some concerns. They're very real. They're very supported by a number of business owners who are operating downtown, whose businesses are starting to strangle and die because they can't get people to come anymore because the parking is so um, heavy handed. And so I do want to make sure when we're having these conversations, we aren't looking at ACDA's budget as the vehicle by which we do these things because that budget is limited and it has to be targeted. We're going to move on from this uh, just so we can, uh, yeah, one response. Yeah, I understand your concern. And, you know, my wife and I go downtown almost every weekend uh, and, you know, we're dumping tons of money in meters and stuff like that during the, during, during the day and stuff like that. Not so much at night, so there's different things we could do. But, I mean, I guess you would say that some people say, yeah, is that downtown's money because, yeah, you're giving up the parking for the ACDA, but at the same time, those revenues are from people all over Anchorage that are putting that meter. So that would be a conversation to have on what is a responsible way to invest those monies. So. Very targeted and direct. Well, let's move forward. Uh, we're going to just continue, if you don't mind. Uh, I would say my, my thoughts are more creative than that. So I think of the vessel and the vehicle of a tool that we invest through and we figure that formula out versus uh, Robin from Peter to give it to Paul. I don't see that as, a, as an option that I was considering as well. I just had to put that on the record. Right on, cool. Um, much more to be discussed. I'd like us to move to the last, the last presentations of our new business. Um, we will continue this. My goal for this is that we have some, hopefully somebody will come together with some beginning parts of a pilot that we can investigate to move toward the steps, necessary steps to take action by next year. Like, what do we need to do so we have a spring thing going on um, this winter to be able to get this, uh, whatever legislative body uh, work that we need to get done. done. On that point, I don't see outreaching lives here for the presentation, but I know we do have Celeste and Michael uh, Fredericks here from the Alaska Black Caucus with an Equity Center Project update. They're going to give us an update, and this is a presentation, so it's not necessarily a discussion, but I want us to be thinking about what we're talking about with respect to older buildings commercial buildings and commercial properties in, and in the downtown corridor. This is what you all are working on now, and I turn the floor over to uh, Celeste. All right, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to present today. I'm Celeste Hodge Browden, President and CEO of the Alaska Black Caucus, the, and I live in Potter Marsh. So the Alaska Black Caucus um, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization um, that really works to on a critical role in am amplifying the voices of the black, BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color communities with an emphasis on the Black community and addressing long-standing disparities in our education, justice, health, and economic systems statewide. <coughs> As many know, the Alaska Black Caucus purchased the building located at 605 Barrel Street along with the adjacent parking lot with plans to renovate the space for a new equity center. This equity center will provide a service hub for the BIPOC community, office space below market rate, uh, to house other BIPOC-led organizations, businesses, and individuals who support the BIPOC community, and a commercial kitchen for rent to allow small businesses the opportunity to thrive um, all in a downtown location with access to meeting space and opportunities for civic involvement. And I'm going to turn the presentation over to Michael Fredericks, as she was introduced earlier, who is the owner of SALT and who was brought on to oversee the design and renovation of the space. Thank you, Celeste. So my name is Michael Fredericks with SALT. Um, this is the property. Uh, just to orient you, uh, Office Depot is just across the street, and then this is the, the cemetery. And actually, the building and parking is on two separate lots, just to let you know 
if we look at the next slide, mm. there, there's kind of this weird situation where there's a thin lock. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll just quickly orient you to the project. So the project team includes North Farm Architects, SALT, Reed Middleton for Structural, T3 for Mechanical Electrical, and Big City Engineers for uh, Civil. The scope uh, is of the project is, it's not a change of use, so it's going to be remain a business use, as Celeste mentioned. Uh, it's a complete interior renovation. Uh, there's a single floor, as you see, and then a half floor basement that will all be renovated. There's interior asbestos abatement, and we we're hoping to upgrade the exterior of the building, but because it is a non-conforming building, we are not going to be able to at this time. Uh, the building is 7,000 square feet, and the assessed value of the building, just the building, not the land, is $270,000 round numbers. And I'm really excited to sort of present to you what's going on because this is sort of an upstream action that you can think about to this vacant building issue that we're having that was presented for housing. Uh, the estimated development cost of the, of the project, which is defined by Title 21, so it's a little bit different than the total project cost, is $1.8 million. If we look at it all in, just to give you some, some thought about value, uh, it's it's probably closer to 2.3 million dollars of upgrades that will be happening um, and so that's three hundred and thirty dollars a square foot of renovation costs so approaching a point where it might be cheaper to just you know rip it down I mean not that we are going to do that but just to give you some context if you go to the next slide please uh, to date, the renovation has been designed, uh, the interior has been demolished, and the asbestos abatement has been completed, so huge improvement to the building already. Uh, and the conditional, uh, conditional construction permit has been approved by the municipality. Um, work now will kind of um, slow down as the ABC continues to secure funding for the project. The big issues though that we're presenting today is that this existing building is uh, situated on the lot so that it has very little green space. And in fact, on Barrow Street, as you see here, the building sits on the lot line and encroaches on the right of way. Uh, due to the age of the property, the building doesn't comply with Title 21 currently, and therefore a non-conforming determination was completed. And multiple deficiencies were noted, as there are. The biggest issue in that, uh, however, is that in current Title 21, AMC 2113060C, um, this requires that the non-conforming property move towards conformity by using 10% of the total project cost to do so. So an estimated, if we're just looking at development costs, an estimated $180,000, which is more than half of the assessed value of the building as it is was purchased. If you're not familiar with um, the code, this part of the code, there's three things. There's lots of things in there, as you see. There's three things I just want to pull out for you. The first is just that you know, non-conforming buildings uh, of this type are required to spend this 10% of the total project cost on bringing the development towards compliance. Uh, and the intent of that is really great. We're not saying that that's not a great thing, right? But um, the second part is that the director, in consultation with the applicant, which we have been working with and the, the muni has been fabulous as always, can determine certain characteristics to be addressed um, that, you know, considering that, for instance, in our case, the bill, we really can't even spend that much money uh, because there's not enough that we can do it that won't. Um, impact other things. Um, the director can can work with us to kind of look at how we spend that, but then if the Black Caucus was not able to spend that 10% or $180,000 in this case, um, they would then have to put the money unspent into a municipal improvement fund. Um, for other improvements on other properties. I've only, I've been working um, with Cook Inlet Housing Authority for 20 years and this has come up with them a lot. So this is something that 
when um, nonprofits that we've been working with have been approaching buildings, it's been a pretty big um, issue. And for this project, it has the potential to kill the project um, just because it's more money to raise. So uh, if you go to the next slide, because of the site conditions, so as I said, there's real, literally not enough we can do to spend this $180,000, which is, again, more than half of the building's current value. Just the building, not the land. Uh, we can remove this pole sign that you see here because it is six feet taller than allowable. We can add some screening. They'll have a new mechanical around the uh, rooftop units. But based on the layout, we really can't accommodate other items um, that the meeting sees as acceptable for conformance. Like, we can't put any, fr the, the frontage or this sort of green space landscape improvements um, would require that they lose parking, in, and that's part of the reason they purchased the building, and something that we, you know, for downtown, we certainly don't want to do. So we just wanted to update you on this quandary and tell you we understand that if you go to the next slide there's really good intent behind this but our proposed solutions and, and SALT sees this over and over and over again in our redevelopment work with um, existing buildings is that we think that this needs to be really looked at um, you know we went really big on the first one let's eliminate it and find other ways to make improvements um, or even reduce it. The percentage of cost has been there for years and years and years. The percentage makes the, as, as you know, inflation and the cost of construction continues to rise, this just becomes a bigger cost. Uh, the other opportunity, because Chris said provides, you know, some solutions, is eliminate the requirement for downtown lots waive the requirement completely for nonprofits who are providing community benefit, give the director more power to waive the requirement. Um, currently, the banking of the 10% the, the is the only option that the director has in code, or eliminate the banking factor. So if you can't spend the 10% and you work closely with the municipality to bring as much into conformity as you can, then you don't have to bank that rest, the rest of it. So these are our sort of our ideas that we propose um, for moving forward. And of course, for Black Caucus, it would be great if, um, you know, the, the project is sort of in an eminent state for them. Yes, we have a, a, a thank you. We have a question, Mr. President. No, no, a question. Well, I kind of a question for Dean, but I think that this list of solutions is, is a good one. I would add a sixth one. It's kind of like number four. But at, instead of giving it to the director, it would be to the assembly. Mm -hmm. Allow the assembly to waive the requirement for a public purpose, mm -hmm. right? So we could find that. I don't know that I would want to grant it to the director. And I have some thoughts and concerns about a general nonprofit waiver because there are certain nonprofits sure. that claim to provide a community benefit, but you can't really find it when you dig really hard. Um, mm -hmm. So as a general classification, I don't know that I'd want to do that, but um, Dean, do you think it would be legitimate to provide a waiver through the assembly? Um, I can't really say off the top of my head here that's something I would research and look into. I was equally prepared with I'm limiting myself to make sure I get to this stuff. And we'll get a response from you. So I think, though, that the key, what Michael just stated, is that this is an imminent concern, meaning a time factor is, is um, yeah. important. And so um, I think that timing is, we could probably get something moving this quarter, moving it done. And then we'll and then we have a, a, a person. Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm certainly interested in this, and I think it's a good test case, again, of like the reality of dealing with older properties, right? Yeah. That, that you think, oh, it's easy to fix it up, or it'll be cheaper than building new, because building new is expensive. So I appreciate the um, Alaska Black Caucus and Michael, you bringing this here. Um, the one comment I'll make about the idea of giving it to the assembly, um, generally speaking, when, when things have to go to the assembly for a public hearing, it adds to the cost, it adds to the consultant time. You know, having been a consultant, I know what it's going to be by the hour. 
and then the idea of giving the director more discretion at the administrative level reduces that cost and so I guess I so I think that's worth exploring but I just want to say generally speaking the reason why you keep things at administrative approval level is because it keeps that cost down for the people who are trying to do things and so I think that would be something to balance but I really like the idea of especially number three um, you know demonstrating community benefit you know this isn't just a business certainly we want more business but it's another thing to say we're trying to provide this community service nonprofits have a different um, just a different financial structure. So um, anyway, I think I think this is a great list, and I'm, I'm interested in talking more about it. Um, so just identify yourself, please. Bill Peterson of the League for Code Abatement. Uh, they do this with billing codes, and not just saying you have to do everything. Instead of doing it all up front, you spread it over three, four, five years, maybe a yearly thing where you take that 10% and you add it to it, coming into compliance. Obviously here, it's kind of unique. They're not going to be able to do all the 10% because of Restriction, but maybe spread it in over a year or anything to ease that cost for the um, property owner and developer. Thank you. Michael Cost? Yeah, thanks. Just to, on the topic Close of costs related to this process, staff versus assembly, the whole concept would be make it cheaper. And so the balance there is well, let's have a professional presentation to the assembly. And that is a cost, but it's a substantially lower cost using this case as an example to prepare for a public hearing than it would be otherwise. And it just, I, I am concerned about granting too much flexibility to staff day to day because we have required this for a reason. The reason is we want to see neighborhoods be improved and brought up to the level. And so I'm, I, it's a debate we can have and I understand the idea of let's make it as cheap as possible, as fast as possible, but I think that there's an argument to be said for make it as cheap as possible, as possible, as fast as possible with checks. I want to thank you all for the presentation. Uh, thank you for the solutioning with us too. I think we understood and understand that there is urgency because this is a project in the works uh, that has been supported by this municipality, by this assembly, and uh, and it's a it's a really important need in our community. So thank you for the solution. Thank you. Uh, we're going to run through this last. Just real quick, if I can. Yes, sir. You're not the only one experiencing this 10% rule. I've received several emails from different projects. I think what we're facing is the in, the inflation of materials and labor has gone up so fast, so rapidly, that projects that normally would not hit that criteria are hitting it more and more often. And now they're hitting now now a project that's already over budget is now being labored with even more expense, sidewalk improvements, etc. And so it's. It's causing pain, uh, not just for you, but uh, for many individuals across the municipality. So thank you. MOA planning, Title 21 folks, come on up. Rapid fire. Uh, you have seven minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should ask the audience a pretty special question. Uh, would you just say who to ask the Is, there any, Is there any member from the audience who would like to participate today? Great. We're going, back for more. So we're, going to save three minutes. we're going to save three minutes. We're going to push this through. Uh, any of this reporting will be available through our website as well. That's correct. Yes, thank you. This is uh, Tom Davis, Long Range Planning Division. Uh, thank you for fitting us in today. We wanted to provide this really heads up about a cleanup follow up amendment to Title 21 that follows up on and does some kind of a mop up operation to two recent, very large. Uh, Title 21 amendments to our parking requirements and our site access requirements. Uh, there's about 36 changes in total. I would say about four fifths of them, about 80%, are really removing references to off street minimum requirement parking requirements or uh, removing use specific off street parking requirements that were hiding in parts of the code that we didn't get to before. Uh, 10% are simply grammar, technical edits. And then the last four or five have to do with making clean of amendments, corrections to uh, a couple of changes made to the uh, site access ordinance that the assembly passed on July 11th. And there's a, uh, in the handout and on the materials available to the public, on the second page, there's an overview table of the amendments, just a page long. Uh, this is a process that we go through the Planning and Zoning Commission, public process. We anticipate there'll be a few more agencies other folks will find, so that by the time this reaches the assembly, there may be a few more, there may be some changes. 
that'll be going through the public process. So we hope to get it to the assembly in time uh, this November, potentially adopt it in time before January 1st. And uh, Elizabeth Appleby is lead, but there's contacts for the both of us if anyone has any questions or your constituents have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wonderful. One, one uh, comment, I'll give the floor to Member uh, Casa. So these correcting items, these kind of technical fixes, are any of them rising to the level that they might confound a development proposal? Uh, I think in general they, they simplify the code. Or no, 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 that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is between now and passage of this thing, are any of the things that you've identified that are problematic or kind of need corrections going to be barriers to a project? Oh, the, the, the issues we're correcting? Right. Okay, I'll yes, I'll, there are a few things that, I'll that answer could be back a little bit challenging. And say that I think it would be, and I can't speak for the assembly, but I think the general consensus you can find that um, the department should lean towards allowing and approving projects, find a read that works if there are barriers that are just technical but might otherwise slow projects down before we correct it. Right? So don't use mistakes as a black line to say, no, you can't do this. I think that would be something that would be a pretty fair assessment of most assembly members. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, very easy. yes, very easy. <laughs> we will look forward to that in coming in November. <coughs> uh, we two, two folks for public comments, and we're going to, how many minutes? Uh, we have the final few minutes for public comments. We will be limited to a maximum of three minutes. And then we're done. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Ellen Kazari. I'm the Executive Director of Great Land Trust. And I was speaking with Mr. Robbins yesterday when he was preparing his information for you. And part of what we were talking about is introducing to the assembly some of the resources, tools, and partnerships available as you make some of these economic uh, development and land management decisions. So I just wanted to clarify a few things about Great Land Trust and what we do, because I'll be back in a few months with some projects that we're actively working on in the municipality. And when I'm not talking about housing, I don't want you to be surprised. So land trust, part of the problem is a lot of different entities are using the same name. Totally confusing. So land trust, there's thousands of them in the country. There are three categories. There are community land trusts, like what Mr. Robbins was talking about earlier. And community land trusts do a wide variety of uh, projects using land. Most of them involve housing and economic development, business development. There are also uh, fiduciary arrangements where there's a uh, trustee that owns land for some beneficiaries. And then there's a third category, and that's where Great Land Trust falls, that focuses on conservation. So we've done work for 30 years in the municipality. <coughs> like Mike pointed out, we've done over 20 projects right here in the Muni. Eight of those have focused on starting or expanding parks. So we work in conjunction with the Muni, with the assembly, with HLB, and we build uh, and expand parks. So that typically means GLT raises the funds, buys the land, donates it to the city. Probably familiar with some of these, Helen Louise McDowell Sanctuary, Campbell Creek Estuary, Natural Area, um, Fish Creek Estuary on the Coastal Trail. Those are all GLT projects, and we have some more in development that we'll be bringing forward. We work in partnership with community councils and with developers because we know part of the housing and the population and the building the workforce is access to parks and recreation, green spaces, livable communities, and that's where we're a great partner for you. So I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm your person to reach out to as we talk about Chugach access, parks and rec, um, access to um, uh, green space. That's what we do at GLT. We love working with the municipality and the assembly, and we have that specialty. So reach out to me. Feel free to, uh, Mike included our website, um, but I'm I love getting your calls, and I'll be back in a few months with some projects we're actively developing in the Muni. We're looking forward to it. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Hi, my name is Crystal Hoke, and I'm a board member with Greenwood Community Land Trust. Uh, it is a nine-member board, which is fully volunteer. Uh, I think I'm a huge advocate for Community Land Trust. I started learning about them in 2019, and then basically watched every YouTube video that exists. <laughs> and uh, I think it's a tool that empowers the local community to create collaborative partnerships. Um, 
and I believe that there could be uh, various districts and parts of Anchorage uh, that look at the neighboring community to be part of the solution. So I think that there should be many community land trusts, and um, there are as small as one street. And so I think that's really important to, like, if there's a particular project, I think that this idea of taking an existing property that's um, not in good shape and kind of minimizing it and creating individual units is a great idea. And also, I think there's a lot of examples of community land trusts doing exactly that. Um, and that is kind of why they were created, is to keep the people that were in a particular area in place so that they, you know, it's a tool for gentrification, essentially. Uh, it, it has been used that way a lot of times. Um, CLTs can be stepping stones between rental and home ownership. Um, the equity that the owner walks away from is usually used as a down payment for a home. So even though they're not getting the benefit of a full equity as a, in a traditional home ownership model, they are walking away with rent that they would no, normally have just given away and not received anything else. So it's a really good stepping stone. Um, and then when you compare it against the structure of affordable housing that's usually used, the individual gets the home and then they eventually sell the home and one family benefits from that affordable housing subsidy. In a CLT model, the subsidy affects seven generations, if not in perpetuity. Um, and then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are expanding interest in supporting community land trusts and increasing financing options for them. And uh, I don't know where I am on the timing, but the last thing I will say is Gerbic Community Land Trust um, has just um, executed a letter of intent with Heritage Land Bank last week, which is a huge stepping stone. Uh, this is something that I've wanted for more than three years. Uh, this is in South Anchor, or sorry, um, Gerba South Town Side Track G6. It's a 14 and a half acre parcel, and we have subdivided it out to have a 2.2 acre parcel so that it's more manageable bite sized piece for development because otherwise it would require a $5 million road before we could start any project at all. So we're trying to reduce the amount of road that's required to start a development. And um, I think that's it. Thank you so much. That's 2.29. You did wonderful. <laughs> and say, when you come back for a fast, rapid fire presentations, you're excellent at that. Um, thank you, everybody. This was a lot, of, lot to learn from. We do have another meeting at 11, so I know our, our members want to get to that meeting. We will continue these conversations. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned.